I'd like to just briefly tell you what those of you who have already been to other presentations know, that this is uh, an important part of the educational uh, uh, programming of Salisbury University. Here at the NAB Center, we're very serious about that. And uh, uh, not only has our speaker uh, agreed to talk to us this evening, but he's been talking in classes from 8 o'clock this morning <laughs> until 5.30 this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and we'll be doing the same thing from 9 t uh, tomorrow morning until he leaves for the airport at 12.30 tomorrow. So we are getting, uh, and he came free to us. He <laughs> came all the way from Oregon without any charge. So, <laughs> so uh, we're getting, I, I think, a good uh, return for our investment. <laughs> I don't know if uh, I should be clapping for that. <laughs> 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 and the second thing I want to say that's involved with our educational pro programming is that the introductions uh, are always given by our interns. Uh, we have an intern in co communication arts this semester, Tiara Collins, uh, and she's going to do our introduction for our speakers. So, Tiara. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tiara. I'm the Communication Arts Intern for the NAB Center this semester. Um, welcome to the NAB Research Center for Delmarva History and Culture. This evening, we're fortunate enough to have documentary photographer Phil Decker and also Fritz Judy, an aide to the local Haitian community, as our noted speakers. Phil Decker, a Maryland native, spent the summers of 1983 and 1984 documenting the living and working conditions of a group of Haitian migrant farm workers from Florida who were living on the eastern shore. Decker saw life through the workers' eyes as he documented their plight in the fields and at the isolated labor camps where the field workers were bused after a long day's work. In addition to creating this photograph and narrative project, Mr. Decker also worked as an outreach worker for migrant farm workers on the Eastern Shore during the same summers. Decker says in his photo document, I took these photos to illustrate the horrid living and working conditions burdening migrant farm workers. But more importantly, I took them to help humanize with feelings and faces migrant labor issues. Mr. Decker earned his bachelor's in philosophy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and his master's in Latin American studies from Stanford. This evening, he joins us all the way from Salem, Oregon, where he now resides with his family and where he also serves as an elementary school principal. In this rare glimpse, he will speak about his insights into the origins of the Haitian community here on the shore. Also joining us this evening is Fritz Judy. Fritz was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. In 2000, he moved to Canada and later to Salisbury in 2005. Soon after arriving in Salisbury, he established the Uster Rice Corporation, which sold food products to immigrants, communities in Maryland and New Jersey. He also opened a second business to support immigrants with needed financial services. For the last year and a half, Fritz has been working for Telemann Corporation as a workforce development specialist, where he assists members of the Haitian community in Salisbury in finding employment and accessing other community resources. Fritz holds a bachelor degree in business administration from the University of Haiti and a bachelor degree in marketing from HEC Montreal in Canada. Fritz and his wife, who teaches nursing here at Salisbury <coughs> University, have one son. Fritz continues his close connections as an advocate to the Haitian community in Salisbury and other nearby areas. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers, Mr. Phil Becker and Mr. Fritz Schutte. And um, Fritz is on his way. He's actually the grand entrance. <laughs> Fritz Judy! <laughs> well, so I just, I just introduced you. Make you. yourself at home, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am uh, really just thrilled to have these images um, come back home to Salisbury and the shore. This has been. Um, a long journey, about 30 years that ago that the photos were taken. And um, they're you know, around us, and there's um, a wonderful video that the NAV Research Center helped to produce on it. So I'm not going to jog through the photos. I'm going to kind of talk a bit about the project and what I hope it means for this community. Um, and then I am just so thrilled to pass the baton after my talk to Fritz Judy, 
who knows so much more about the um, current Haitian community here on the shore and, um, and will we'll share what he knows with you as well. Um, so I first want to start off with an appreciation. Um, I really appreciate uh, the collaboration and the work uh, with Dr. Ray Thompson. We've had a great run for the last, I think, year and a half, 100 plus emails later, um, to bring this document to the NAB. And to me, it really is the perfect place for it. Um, not only is it because it's home where the photos were taken, okay, but I also, in, in looking at the website on the NAB and talking with Dr. Thompson, know that this is a place, um, although a small room, right, um, soon to be bigger, I hear, um, but uh, a place where dialogue um, lives about history and how history impacts our present. And so um, I think that uh, to have a place where this document can take its role in um, and really the dialogue about historical, social issues on the shore um, is a real honor for me. And, um, and I've really enjoyed um, uh, our collaboration and, and, um, and thank you for, for bringing it home. It means a lot to me. Um, these images have been in my, in my closet for too long. <laughs> and, um, and they served a purpose right when they were taken, kind of as advocacy work. And, um, and slideshows were created from them, publications were created from them, to use them in those issues right at the time. But, you know, I'm not really a wine drinker, but I hear that if you let it sit for a long time, it kind of savors and gains in, um, in terms of, uh, of importance. And so I think that's happened to the photos. They take on a different meaning now that they've, um, that they've been in the closet for 30 years. And now they're out of the closet, and the beauty is that they really do um, uh, provide not a comprehensive document on the Haitian experience on the shore, but they, they, um, they help to fill that gap. And I think that Dr. Thompson recognized that, and I was thrilled to, um, to be able to serve this community by, by bringing them, them back. Um, we, when we had dinner last night, we had a, a, a nice conversation and, um, uh, about how important it is to kind of keep history alive and well and relate it to the present, right? And that it's definitely not too late to be thinking about the immigrant experience here of our Haitian community and really all of our communities because we're all immigrants to America um, unless you're native to this, um, to this land. And I commented to um, Dr. Thompson that in my background, we're still working through Exodus. <laughs> I mean, every Passover meal. Right? We still sit at the table and are trying to struggle with Exodus. <laughs> and that's like 5,000 years ago. Right? <laughs> so this is just 30. It's only the beginning. <laughs> okay? and, um, and I think I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but my background as someone who is, I consider, a stealth minority. I'm Jewish. Okay? And that is, is key to this document for me. Okay? Um, because I am the grandson of immigrants who fled pogroms in Eastern Europe, right? And the classic migration uh, fled pogroms into the Lower East Side of New York City, Yiddish speaking, okay? Grandpa Alex was a barber, Grandma Lena was a seamstress, okay? I'm Phil Decker, but I would have been Phil Deckelbaum, oh, okay. okay? I'm stealth, right? You wouldn't know it, okay? Um, but that identity of uh, my immigrant identity and really paying homage to Grandma um, Lena's and Grandpa Alex's sacrifice um, to enable me to live a good life in America um, is what fueled my interest and has my whole professional life um, in terms of serving other immigrant communities. And, um, uh, and so uh, I really love this opportunity for us to explore um, other immigrant communities to serve other immigrant communities um, here on the shore. Uh, so uh, let's see, the other people I'd like to honor here before talking a bit about the background of the document is um, we have so many experts in the crowd, okay? Um, I'm really thrilled to introduce everyone to none other than the woman who took the risk of hiring me, my first real job out of college, um, which led to this document is Karen Webster. So Karen, you want to stand up and get your round of applause? <laughs> so I'm not sure if Karen would tell the story the same way, but I had learned some Spanish while picking apples with farm workers in Washington State, 
right? I have a degree in philosophy from University of Maryland. And what do all philosophy students need to do? <laughs> to wander, right? That's what you do, right? So I wound up in one of my wanders picking apples in Washington State um, with a Mexican crew. Was really curious, where are these people from? Growing up in D.C., Mexico could have been Peru for all I knew. I mean, I didn't really have an awareness of the border like I do now. And so I followed them down into Mexico just to um, explore the land that they came from and picked up some Spanish along the way, contacted um, the Governor's Commission on Migratory Labor in Maryland to see how could I serve farm workers in my home state of Maryland. And then somebody must have mentioned Migrant and Seasonal Farm Worker Association, and I showed up, and I think that was it. You might have more of the story, but that's all I can remember. Um, and so that first summer, I was an outreach worker for the Migrant and Seasonal Farm Worker Association. <laughs> and just had a little itty bitty camera and started taking portraits of farm workers. First photo ever per published of mine was in the Salisbury um, News of a farm worker named Sam um, back in, I think, 83 or 84. Just like close up portraits. And then decided to take the photography more seriously and went to the International Center of Photography in New York City for the um, school year to come back the next picking season and to first meet up with the crew I had already met, um, meet them up and meet them with them in Florida and then um, document them in the fields and um, in the labor camp. Okay? Um, so that's sort of the, the origin of that. When I showed up in ICP, the International Center of Photography in New York City, they thought, they must have thought I was nuts because I just showed up with like a bag of some photos of farm workers I had taken. Right? And other people had the vest and the cameras and the lenses. And I had the little camera where you click the lens and a bag of farm worker photos. And they took me. It was a miracle. And I think it's because they said, first, the guy's crazy. And then I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wasn't waiting for someone to send me on an assignment. I said, I have to learn how to use the camera. I have to learn how to develop film because I got this crew waiting for me next summer. And I need to get back down um, to, to follow them back up from Florida and document them. So um, they said, sure, let's do this. Um, this will be a bit of a tangent, but for those of you that are interested in documentary photography, okay, that's sort of the genre this is in, this is not photojournalism. It's not like you're on assignment for two, or, uh, you know, two days or a day. This is you hang out with folks, you become part of their community for months, if not years, um, to really document, have a comprehensive document on their lives. And um, so in, in that work, um, this follows in the tradition of the Farm Security Administration document, Dorothea Lang, right, Arthur Rothstein, Russell Lee. Um, there's, a, there's a precedent set, especially in terms of farm workers in documentary photography. And I found myself 50 years later attempting to do the sequel on my own, though, to the FSA. Um, but it, it definitely, I want to pay homage to that tradition of documentary photography um, that this is part of. And it's even before them. It's Lewis Hine with child labor. That's why I picked this image as the signature one. Lewis Hine had children working in factories. Um, and this is uh, the, the equivalent in the fields, you know, to, to um, show about the child labor. And Jacob Reese even before them in terms of slums of New York City. So there's a, a long history of photographers taking their time, connecting with people, and doing this long -term, these long-term documents. Um, and um, so what you have here is my first one, my first crack at it, okay? When I was in about 21, 22 years old, right out of college. And um, other expertise in the room is the Migrant and Seasonal Farm Worker Association turned into Telemon. And I know Karen was the director for that for many years. But there's a lot of Telemon folks in the crowd. So all you Telemon people, come on, wave, stand up. We need to know who you are because you're great resources here for the community. Um, would somebody like to tell us um, really briefly what Telemann does? Because one, one of the beauties of this uh, great group that is here um, at, for this turnout is to really not just pay homage to this particular crew or to see my photos, but my hope, and I really think it's it going to be realized, is that you connect um, among yourselves and can continue to uncover the stories of the immigrant communities here on the, on the shore. Um, were you going to speak about that a little bit, Fritz, later, about Telemann? Since my watch is here, she can use five minutes on my time. 
Uh huh. <laughs> that was. Yeah. This is Jennifer. <laughs> Could you tell us just in a, in a in a nutshell kind of what Telemann does? Because I think the, the the amazing thing here is that I used to work with that group. Now Fritz took my job 30 years Oops. later, right? <laughs> um, um, but it's a vibrant force supporting immigrant communities yeah. in this area. So, but at that time, I'm thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, a handful of families uh, back in those mid 80s. It wasn't um, a Haitian community that's thousands strong like uh, like it is today. So. Um, <laughs> So that this document then, um, although it focuses on one crew, and then actually, as you'll learn, a family within the crew, um, uh, still helps to represent the beginning of the Haitian community on the shore. And now it's much more vibrant, many more people, many more stories out there. Um, I want to just um, jog through a couple other connections that might um, inspire some further research or um, those to dig in a little bit deeper. And um, oh, actually, let me, b before I go there, um, there's another organization I work with a lot in my role as an outreach worker, and that's none other than Legal Aid, because there was one or two problems out there in the migrant labor camps. <laughs> and so um, we do have um, representatives from Legal Aid, so you have great resources in the room. And one connection with that connection is that Greg Shell, who was the um, uh, Legal Aid attorney at the time that I was there, um, we met frequently. And when I had finished this document, um, I wanted to do the sequel. I said, uh, Greg, I want to continue with other immigrant groups that are part of the migrant stream. And so I wanted to do a, a, a Mexican document. And I did. It was, it's a much larger document than this. Um, it's still being digitized. I'm working on that little by little. It's a year in the life of a crew. Okay? Um, I met them in the orchards in Arizona, went down to their villages in Querétaro in Mexico. And um, when I was young and kind of looked like that and was in better shape, <laughs> it's an embarrassing picture, um, uh, um, across the border several times with them to show the whole yearly um, cycle. And Greg is the one that said, yeah, you got to meet Lupe Sanchez. Lupe Sanchez runs the Arizona Farmworker Union. It's a union of undocumented, right? And legally sound is an undocumented union. union. And um, so I spent about a, about a year, year and a half as my next, um, uh, my next work um, there. Um, I might as well go ahead and just paint that picture of, of how I got here from there. Is, um, and uh, those of you the students in the crowd, those of you who are still studying, okay, um, the message behind this little bird walk is um, you never know where things might take you, okay? Um, and so, uh, so, like I mentioned, the picking apples in Washington gave me a little bit of an intro to, to um, farm work. That brings me to Mexico, a little bit of Spanish, brings me to Karen Webster and MSFA. Greg Shell sends me on over to Arizona, and I did that document. Um, and uh, was widely published and um, exhibited in the Cannon Rotunda in Washington, D.C. during the last immigration debate, which was um, 1985, Simpson Rodino, that became the, 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 the law. And that was supposed to be, for me, like the great culmination. You know, oh my gosh, it's in the halls of Congress during the debate. Doesn't get better than that. And I would watch people come by and during their lunch break and go, hey, great shot, beautiful picture. And really, it made me feel like, you know, photography's not going to do it. I'm not going to be able to change the world with photographs, right? Um, and I also, uh, so I was thinking, you know, how else can I contribute? Although I love photography, and I feel that's like a, a talent and a joy for me, but, but I'm not sure that's the way to make um, social change. And um, so then um, I was uh, working with the Inter-American Foundation. They published a story of mine on the Mexican document. And a gentleman said, you know, I think you need to read a little bit of Paulo Freire. And Paulo Freire, who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed, a Brazilian educator, um, uh, had the point that, and I didn't get it, the light bulb didn't go off, I was being the classic muckraker model. You take the photos, and you go back to DC, you go to New York, and you try to spread the word. Right? And so this was a different approach. Why not just teach the people that are organizing themselves to use the media tools for their own development? Right? So, um, so I switched my approach. And then um, when I was in Stanford, what I studied was grassroots communication, how to use mo many media, not just photography, but kind of tucked into grassroots organizations, tucked into development projects to help people 
um, to help themselves, rather than me do my expose of them. Right? And um, then that led to me meeting my wife and um, four kids and four grandkids later. Um, you know, photography wasn't going to pay the bills, so um, <laughs> I figured, hmm, bilingual, want to help immigrant communities, love to teach, and I became a middle school teacher, a bilingual middle school teacher right on the border, and then, but always with the eye of developing community, and so hence an elementary school principal, because what better place to raise community than something we all share in common, which is the resident, the, the neighborhood school. Um, and so my school is about 70% Latino, bilingual school in Salem, Oregon, another rich agricultural valley, um, and, uh, and so that's kind of the, the route. Uh, but the strand that's consistent, going back to my own immigrant roots and being there to serve in different ways, photographer, writer, teacher, principal, um, the, na the next waves, the next waves of immigrants. Right? And so once again, I um, uh, really uh, um, uh, hope that, that this talk and this archive can help spark more connections so that, uh, that the community goes deeper into continuing to document and explore their own immigrant communities. All right, on the way down here, I saw the little sign by Easton, right by the Easton Diner, right, which has very good crab soup, by the way. Um, Frederick Douglass's birthplace. I said, oh, I've got to figure out if I'm going to go down there. Right? So I had my crab soup and got on my, my phone and found out that that might not exactly be Frederick Douglass's birthplace and that it um, is just a sign, not like a big visitor center. So I didn't make the eight-mile pilgrimage down that road, but I found out that uh, Frederick Douglass, and you already know this, Fritz, okay, um, was the minister to... Haiti, towards the end of his life, okay, in um, 19, uh, 1890, 1890s, when he was in his 70s. For two years, he was the um, uh, minister of Haiti. Interesting Eastern Shore connection to Haiti. Um, and then I found out that he had a very famous speech, his Chicago World Fair speech. Haven't read it all, read little excerpts from it. Um, and it was a very important speech, one that um, and having lunch with Fritz today, Fritz knew that speech, right? And um, uh, where he really talks about these deep connections and the lessons you can learn from Haiti's history, right? And, um, uh, and, and so uh, that's also another connection to explore. There's many, many lessons uh, that resonate for us from the Haitian story. Issues of colonization, of slavery, of revolution, of race, right? They're part of that Haitian story, and now they're part of our American story. And they, they, it's even richer because those stories have mixed together. Um, uh, I got a fantastic book. The only time I get a lot of reading done is when you're on the airplane, right? <laughs> so this was my airplane book. Um, I really recommend it, The Butterfly's Way by um, Edwidge uh, Danikat. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Um, Voices from the Haitian Diaspora in the United States. And what I've learned is there's multiple diasporas, right? There's diasporas from earthquakes. This diaspora is coming from the 70s, and that's the diaspora from what? What's the, what's the, um, the push factors for this diaspora that brought people to Florida and then brought people to the shore? Duvalier. Duvalier. And so it's, it's the baby dock um, and the boat people um, time. So these are either boat people themselves or most likely um, or children of, of boat people. I'm not sure if everyone's in that situation, but I, I think that's more the origin of this community around Lake Okeechobee and then their migration here um, to the United States. So I wanted to share um, just a little excerpt from one of these pieces, um, Marlene Phipps, um, who is a poet and a Haitian poet and um, and painter. And, um, oh, hold on. Sorry, Marlene, it's not going to be yours. 119. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Okay. So, um, and I think what she says here really speaks to um, all immigrant communities. And, and I really like the way she put this. This is called Pour Water on My Head. Um, she writes, um, technically speaking, I can paint any place, but if I choose one place, it has to do with its meaning. 
Art is an act, an effort of communication. Art cannot survive as only a self-indulgent endeavor. Haiti offers me uh, t items of meditation into which, because of my particular connection to the country, I can tap and develop further. Cambridge, where I now live, offers me a nurturing environment. Populations of the world are no longer being confined to their original shores. I like that. The populations of the world are no longer confined to their original shores. Different cultures are colliding with each other in close quarters and entering each other's consciousness. Through people like me, a Haitian-born painter and poet, foreign imagination is entering the American consciousness and system of reference. Many of us, the uprooted, may have come empty-handed, but certainly not empty-hearted. I came with all that I have been and felt before, with all that my parents had been and felt before, with all that my ancestors had been and felt before, with the company of spirits. So I continue to live and fight even in those days when there is no wind in my sails. I continue to pour water on my head so the sun might glimmer on me, on all of us. And I like that as a photographer, the um, sun glimmering on her head. Um, and so I really think it, it speaks to um, how everyone brings their history. And, and, and that histories are, are, are meshed together um, here in, in, in our community. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to um, pass the baton to Fritz Judy. I was really pleased to um, connect with Fritz. I did not want to do this opening alone. I had to have someone who really knew the Haitian community and could speak about that from, from his personal experience and his expertise. Um, and uh, so that to me is a real joy to have um, uh, Fritz join me. And um, I really hope that um, uh, folks will connect with Fritz and folks from Telemann, Legal Aid, and, and, and continue this dialogue. And the NAB is a perfect place to continue to pull those ideas and people together um, to keep um, this exploration of our Haitian community and other immigrant communities alive and well um, here on the shore. Okay. So, Passing the baton to you, Fritz. Come on down. <laughs> I just have to say, we, we had the perfect place for lunch today. Of course, you know, Jewish guy, Haitian guy, where are we going to be eating? Chipotle. Chipotle, of course. It's <laughs> God bless America. <laughs> Having grown up in the ancient Shrooms, what was the typical Eastern Shore reaction to these people? I mean, general people living on the shore that weren't migrants. Um, was there a lot of acceptance? Was there a lot of discrimination? Mm -hmm. Were there any interactions at all? Were they completely separate? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. You know, so I, I, hard for me, from my experience of an outreach worker for mm -hmm. a couple summers, um, to speak for the, the shore in general. Um, I do know that um, there, I interface a lot with, with the growers. Okay. <coughs> And they mainly, um, they didn't connect as much with the Haitians as with the crew leader who would seek the work for them. Um, the times we went into town, it felt like there was, you know, um, acceptance. There were many agencies involved in supporting the farm workers, um, uh, church groups, social service agencies. I think one, one issue to speak of and um, that was more internal to the camp, which um, is an area for exploration, is that... Um, uh, for a crew that is part half African American and part Haitian, that was quite an interaction and a, and a learning experience. Because the more you know about the history of Haiti and the United States, they come from such different historical circumstance, right? That for the Haitian community, um, it was kind of new to understand and, in a sense, to be schooled by the African American crew on what it really meant to be black in America, which is very different than being black in Haiti. Um, so I, I thought that was the, the more um, immediate interaction that I experienced. Uh, but others uh, that have been working with the community, with the farm workers for longer, might be able to um, add to that. Um, Bud Luther, Bud um, Luther yeah, had his home base in um, South Bay. Mm -hmm. South Bay. South Bay, which is near is Lake Florida. Okeechobee. Okay, Florida. In Florida, okay. okay. And um, just for those that um, are interested in the local geography, 
Um, his uh, camp, which was called a hotel, although it wasn't a hotel, um, is not there anymore. I, it's um, Nanticoke Road, about 14 miles out. I went there on my way in to hopefully find something, or at least an artifact, like an archaeologist. <laughs> it said no trespassing, and I went in there anyway, because I thought maybe I'd find something from the camp. But now it's kind of rubble. It's been demolished, um, uh, but it's out, out in Nanticoke Road. You said about 14 miles? About 14 miles out in Nanticoke Road on the, on the left-hand mm -hmm. side. Yeah. Okay, you All ready right. to roll? Yes, sir. I was just stalling for you, Fritz. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm good at that. That's a good teamwork. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, before that I start my presentation, I would like to take um, this time, behalf of the Haitian community, to thank Mr. Phil Decker for this hard work that is accomplished behind the Asian community. Mr. Decker. And uh, my presentation tonight will be like um, a bridge between the past and the present. Uh, during the rock, the, document the documentary that uh, Mr. Decker introduced to you, you have a chance to get in touch with the Haitian com community, how they came over here. And now, my job is like to connect, to show you those people 30 years, 20 years, 20, 25 years since they, become, since they came, since they, they moved to the Eastern Shore, what they accomplish. I think a lot of, of you, ask you that, ask yourself that question. 30 years. The children of those people, of those people you just you saw in the picture, what they accomplish. That's why I call my presentation an overview of the evolution of the Haitian living in the Eastern Shore. And um, to be honest with you, the Eastern Shore is very big. And uh, regarding the time, I have 15 minutes, I will be able to cover all the accomplishment of the Asian on the Eastern Shore. But I'm just going to use those 15 minutes to go over with a couple of one with you. And first of all, I would like to introduce you this man. This man is Hebrew Saint Fleur. This man came to the United States um, when he was about 12 years. He was raised in a long, long, long island, New York. And then moved to Salisbury, Maryland, moved to the Eastern Shore on his early 20 years. And this man, between 50, between 20 years since he came here, where he was 20, and now he's 45 years, this man won right now one of the large business in the Eastern Shore. And uh, his business is the owner and the CEO of Hebrew Quality Construction. And uh, also, this man is living in Salisbury with his family. So that means the tax is good for the, the, the mayor, you know? <laughs> and um, the firm also operates Hebrew, quali 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 Hebrew Quality Insulation, Hebrew Quality Housing and then Development, because it causes on right now about more than 100 houses that you went for people, you know? And um, also Hebrew investment. But last year, regarding all these accomplishments, the Maryland Capital Enterprise, the MC, they took him uh, in, in, in body and become one of the members of the board of the director of the MC. That's for Mr. Hebrew Saint Fleur. I have another one. I have Mr. Jeff and Point du jour. He's very young. He's just 29 years. And, he's a, and, he, and uh, he got a, a unisex loan. He's helping the, the Latinos and people. He's helping the Haitian, the Caribbean and um, people. And he got about five people working for him. So now he contributes to the community to give job to the, to the community. And then, we have also Mr. Abakuk, pay attention. Mr. Abakuk, pay attention, is running his own business, help multi services. Just to let you know, help is stand for his name, Abakuk, E stand for his wife, Edlin, and P for, P for Pitchon. It's nice, eh? 
So now he's doing taxes and also he's doing immigration paperwork for the Haitian community because most of the case we have, when the, when the Haitian people came here, they don't know nothing about English. And I remember every single Haitian that I used to work, even when I used to run my own business here, because since I moved from Canada to come over here, I started to run my own business, check car touching, things like, 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 things like, 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 like that, just to help my community. Because the problem is, when they came, the first time they came here, they can't speak English. And every single place they went, they have to speak. And the other thing also, for the type of, of service, they need to pay their, uh, their um, bills, they need to send money on into the country, but they have to be able to, to talk. So I think that's why I think this is a good opportunity when you have the Haitian up in the business like, like that. When the Haitian came, he feel home. He feel a little hey, because he can ask a question, he can do what they, whatever he wants. Because, you know, as you know, the language put a barrier big barrier. Even though that person is, is very smart, but since that person knows he can't speak the language well, he just put a barrier like that person feels very demonized. Very, very little. So um, the other person is Caribbean Express Market. Um, the runner is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is Mr. Charity, Jean Charity. Um, I think this business is the first Haitian business in the area is in the Florida Avenue. All the Latinos and people, they went over, over, they went over there to buy food product. And uh, I think this business um, has been on the Eastern Shore more than, f more than 15 years to help our people. Because you know, the food is the one of the most time, even though I don't like to eat more. And, and Mr. Phil, so the care. <laughs> All right. So, this is another uh, accomplishment for those uh, people who came from Haiti, you know, BMB Dock, Duvalier, or the earthquake, any kind of way they came to Haiti. And when, when they, uh, they, uh, they came here, they worked very hard to contribute to the community. And now we're going to, we're, now we're going to talk about doing churches. The Haitian, the Haitian didn't come here to just do business. The Haitians also, they, ha they are very conservative pe um, um, people. They are strong belief, the Haitian. That's why when the Haitian is going to move to a place, the first question he asks you, a church? They're going to find a church over there? Right now, I'm working as a case manager at Telamon. Every time I'm doing outreach and, and invite them to stay in the area, the f the, her first question is, I'm going to find a church to worship? So the Haitian, right now, this is a huge accomplishment. This is the first Haitian United Methodist Church. That's, the, that's just for the Haitian community. And this is the inside, inside in the church, you know. And uh, Mr. Deke was very happy to see the Jewish flag. He was very, two of them <laughs> inside the Haitian church. <laughs> yeah, so. So this is the first session we had at this church, one of the uh, accomplishments of the, and the uh, pastor is Pastor Fogobert Jean Baptiste, he's the one to, the big dreamer to accomplish this church. And this is a second church, again, World Life Center. You know? So um, the pastor, this is the pastor, Pastor Gary Nicholas and Pastor Roosevelt Tursen. By the way, Pastor Roosevelt and uh, Tursen I think it's uh, about 15 years ago, he won a Haitian community center here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happened, but the community center is closed now. Mm -hmm. It's closed now, so I don't know what that's happened. So we used to have a Haitian community center as, as a center. But right now, since we have a lot of Haitian move in the area, I think we're working on that issue to have, to set something like, like that. Mr. Selama, is that you? We're working on something like that, right? So, um, that was the end of my presentation. But to finish the presentation, I have to, I need to share a story with you. Um, I know a man. Um, this man right now is 85 years, a Haitian. 
He left Haiti when he was 57. He came to the United States. And he left behind a woman with eight kids. He came to the United States. He worked hard on the field, immokalali. He worked very hard on the field. Tomatoes win tomatoes to send more money to raise his kids. And after a couple of years, he got a contract with a company they, they call Sixers. The Sixers company moved over here, bring them, drove them, and bring them, and brought them in the Eastern Shore. I think he's um, um, Chrisfield. And they went over there and they tried to work on the tomatoes, and he worked hard on the on tomatoes. Back and forth, five years. After the fifth years, he said, you know what? I like Eastern Shore. I fell in love with the Eastern Shore. I'm going to leave. I'm going to stay in the Eastern Shore. He decided to stay. He moved. He decided to, to stay back on AD, AD 1. And then when he decided to, to, and, and to stay, he started to work at chicken plant, pearl at the chicken plant. Now he got money, earned about $600 a, year, a month, earned money and sent more money to Haiti. And 1999, he was lucky. He brought all his eight kids and his wife from Haiti to the United States in 1999. All those eight kids came. Today, one of them is a physician. One of them is a pharmacist. One of them is a agronomist. Two of them is an engineer. And one of them is a nurse practitioner. And as a matter of fact, she's teaching on Salisbury University right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's sick. She can make it, because I know that that's a woman. And that woman is my wife. Thank you. <laughs> Have any questions of Phil or Chris? I'm sure they'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Whoops. Um, sorry. Thanks, Chris. That's all. Right. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I had a question. Uh, what I was saying about it, I was sort of struck by, even though I, they were taken in 1980, there's almost a little bit of an out of time type of quality. Yeah. I almost feel like if I looked at them, they could easily be mistaken for 1950 or something. I didn't know if that was something mm -hmm. intentional that you were trying mm -hmm. to do. The black and white. Well, there's a symptoms in which the time period is mm -hmm. erased. So, so let, 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 that's a, a great <laughs> comment. Let's dig in there a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Is what do you think about the photos gives them that quality? What, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the. I mean, it's, it's not intentional, but I'm 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 curious to what you see in them that would give them that quality. I don't know if it's because of the the black and white. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe in, on one hand, it seems like there's not a lot of detail on mm -hmm. some level. I don't know mm -hmm. if there's... Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it has a lot to do with um, the documentary image. That, that um, uh, to me, I think that's a, a nice compliment because they should be um, somewhat timeless, although they do speak to the time. Okay. Um, so let me do a little rabbit trail to, to answer that about black and white. Okay, so this is um, the photographer um, speaking in, in here. Is that, um, uh, I mean, I'll just take one, for instance. Uh, uh, this image, I love this image of this Haitian couple together. Really, they were madly in love in the labor camp. <laughs> this is Augustine, I forgot his wife's name, but they really loved each other and they were happy because they were together, right? And so that's what I'm trying to capture that embrace and the. Um, and then there's geometry involved, you know, and some elements of light. But this could be like an orange door, right? And so if this was an orange door, you're not going to stay here, but you stay right there, framed by these ge geometric elements, you know, the circles and the square. I mean, that's, and they're framed in there. But the color could be distracting, okay? So, um, when you're doing documentary work, especially black and white, you're focused on different things, okay? And actually, I find myself now returning to black and white, okay? Because it really sort of, um, the word comes in Spanish, estrae, like to extract, 
Okay, you're extracting um, from what you're seeing um, more about gesture and emotion and expression and light than about exactly what it what it looks like. So I think they become more timeless because of that extraction of what you're seeing in black and white. Um, and then um, also, uh, if you were to look at the Farm Security Administration images, you know, from the 1930s, the Dust Bowl images of migrants, and you were to look at these, and you look at my Mexican document, and other photographers since then that have documented a similar um, uh, theme, they all have that quality because we're really seeing over such a long period of time these same issues coming up over and over again. Um, you know, uh, I always remember Lupe Sanchez, who was the um, head of the union when I did my Mexican document. I was so excited. I had these pictures and I was developing them in, his, in the bathroom of his apartment. I set up my little dark room and I'd come running out and go, Lupe, Lupe, look at these pictures. Look at this one's incredible. And I remember him telling me, you know, I'm sick and tired of those pictures, you know. I go, what, this is a great shot, look at the angle, look at, you know, this is, this is fantastic. He goes, I'm really looking for, forward to the day when I don't see any more of those pictures. Because he's waiting for the reality to change. Mm -hmm. But until it does, you know, y they become timeless because you've seen it before as well, yeah. Yes? Kind of, kind of picking up on what you're saying, you know, they're hoping for things to change, and that's what strikes me when I look at this, and I'm sure the people from Talamon can see it. If you go to, like, the nearest camp, camp. let's say, like, what's over, you yeah, go there, mm -hmm, the description of the cinder block and all that gets to give. Maybe Bud Motel is down, but the other camps you see is that are the same thing you right. mm -hmm. look pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So there's still work to so be done. The <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. like it remains the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, these are basically not semi-nomadic gatherer people for a living, not hunter-gatherers, but I mean, we're looking at, they had what, a suitcase on average? Is that about right? Yeah, suitcase, a bag. Mm -hmm. That's it. Each person had a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at what they're, what they're housing, and they don't have stuff. I think that's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. There's nothing decorating in the thing. It's absence. Mm -hmm. And and in Florida, in the you know where you would call home, you know there was a bit more stuff. I mean, you have an apartment and you have you know some clothing you leave behind, but when you come on the on the migrant stream, you're you're carrying a suitcase with you. Is their home just another rent, like a place they rented? Yeah. yeah. The same people. Mm -hmm. And there's some pictures um, here of the apartments. Mm -hmm. um, this is a nice image of sort of like a, it's the, uh, the Haitian part of town in South Bay. Um, and they were small apartments. Uh, so these are all kind of way stations. Uh, one of the things I, I'm, it's unfortunate is I don't really, um, I haven't kept touch and I don't know where these particular families are. And I really wish I did. Um, two in particular, you'll see uh, uh, this photograph document focuses on Clacelia, a 13-year-old girl. The um, magazine article that was published on that is part of the archive, plus many of my field notes. Karen made sure I wrote down everything I did every day, and I kept some of them. And so, so some of them are here as part of the archive. You know, um, one of the uh, uh, Haitian uh, fellows who came with Bud Luther mm -hmm. right about your time mm -hmm. uh, was Jean Saint Val. Well, not uh, long yeah, afterwards, he yeah. calls me mother. <laughs> Not long afterwards, he started college, graduated from SU, mm -hmm. and then got a master's, master's in degree. Work. Yes. Fantastic, yes. yes. Uh -huh. So he, he worked with uh, Snow Hill Social Services at uh -huh. one point. Yeah. He yeah. was the director of Social mm -hmm. Services so, uh -huh. Snow Hill. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, make a shameless plug for a project that hopefully, because I got to go back to Oregon, I got my hands full, I have a school I need to raise up. Um, but uh, what would be an incredible compliment to this document, okay? Um, and I've talked to Fritz about it over half of a salad at um, Chipotle. And, um, and I talked to Nicole about that in a, in a class as well. And, and I've been putting the, the bug in other people's ears is that you have people's stories here that 
would bring this document up to date. Okay, I, I really don't want to be the voice. I'm not the voice for the Haitian history and Haitian community. I mean, I would love this to be sort of a catalyst for people to collect more stories. And if you had an interview with John Val, if you had interview with um, your father-in-law, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and, and to, to marry that to the photographs, you have the origin in pictures, and then to have, whether it's video or transcript or more photographs, you could um, really fill in that document and bring it to the present and talk about people's um, stories. And uh, that's a great project for students. Um, Fritz was talking about maybe a church group getting involved, one of the Haitian churches. But it's just rich. It's a rich history to, um, to start to collect. Um, and you already have a great beginning here at the NAB with um, a deposit yeah, of these images the and, the, um, and some of the field notes to get it started. Yeah. Yes? I have no sense of migrant workers now. When I first came here, people were always talking about the migrant workers, migrant workers, migrant workers. When we were in deep winter, the church I went to had services in Spanish, and I'm saying, well, they're here in the wintertime, they're not migrating anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, anytime you have a regular schedule, mm -hmm. that might suggest that they're here when it's not mm -hmm. the season for something yeah. growing. So I have no clue for the Haitians. I've heard come, people come say, around and there are a lot of Haitians here. We were in some yeah. discussion, uh, and they said there are a lot of Haitians here, but I guess it wasn't time to think for, some, for them to tell me where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it depends, because um, right now regarding the regarding Telamon or the corporation that I belong, uh, we have a difference between the seasonal from worker mm -hmm. and migrant from mm -hmm. worker. Okay. You know? um, the, the big difference is for the migrant from worker, when the people came and they, and they already live in the, uh, in the, in the area, mm -hmm. And they just decide to go to work on the, on, on, on the field, mm -hmm. you know, like that. We call them migrant. Okay? But when the people, they don't live in the area, they came from, like, every year, for the summertime, we have a people came from New York, came from Jersey, came from Florida, came to, to work here, you know? And they just work like a seasonal. They came seasonal and back and forth. They finish work and they go. Because so usually. We're having that pattern. Yeah, but, okay. but, uh, but, 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 I got the reverse? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The seasonal is the one who will, will stay, will leave, yeah. Because the thing is, um, for the farm work, worker, they move place to place, you know. So in, I think in, uh, between, uh, in uh, March in Florida, they have the oranges. And uh, now in May, June, it's going to start the watermelons here. They move here. They follow. Here. They, follow they, they follow. And then they're going to North Carolina for the sweet potatoes. Okay. They're going for the our purpose. So this is so still, this, this pattern is still going. Yeah, okay. it's still going. Okay. On, uh, until Telamon came and Telamon said, "We have a better offer for you. <laughs> we invite you to stay in the area. Yeah. That's the part of it for job." You know, Forty years ago, there were a lot of seasonal people mm -hmm. in the area. They mm -hmm. just yeah. aren't here anymore. And uh, Senator Stolfus just closed his cabbage operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to get uh, people from there who the only work they did was, uh, you know, raising the baby cabbage plants. And then if they wanted to settle out, um, they would come and we would work with them. But th those places just don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Settle out. So it used to be. It used to be when farm workers went to the job service and said, "Well, it's winter time. I need a job." Job service said to them, "Just wait till the next season." That was the solution. And then it went to federal court, and they told job service, "You have to." You know, if a farm worker wants mm -hmm. to work in the winter, it's your duty to help them find mm -hmm. a job if that's what he wants. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a picture of a family that I helped uh, settle out. And, um, <laughs> and I remember um, this, uh, her baby was born at the hospital here, and we were there for that. I even have a picture of um, Karen with your late husband holding that baby when it was recently born. Mm -hmm. Oh. And um, uh, and so the big thing was like he got a car. <laughs> okay, he got a job at the plant. We helped him get a um uh, apartment to rent. And you know, 
Um, so he was um, able to settle out. And I think that's kind of how the community grew, was um, mm -hmm. individual by individual over the years. Um, I'd like to add, if yeah. I may, please. Of course. Some different organizations <coughs> have a different meaning for migrant and system mm -hmm. work. Okay. The legal aid may have one mm -hmm. definition, mm -hmm. and migrant education may have another one, or, you know, like Telemon or other organizations that help. Mm -hmm. farm workers. Those numbers, that's what he's Even healthcare. Even healthcare, right. 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 I just had a, a on the topic of settled out, yeah. um, an estimate on numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, including actually, I heard there's a large community in Seaford as well. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of estimates? I know these numbers are very, very sure. slippery, yeah. but um, you know, what what's the size of the Haitian community these days that is settled in Del Marva? If we take it the whole. All right. Community? That's a good question. I remember um, that was the first question I was asking myself, because when I when I was um, try to run a business here, I have to get so my target was the Haitian and the Latinos and people. So I have to get a great idea about the, the number. So I went to the a lot of research, the census. I went everywhere, the Congress. They, they can't give me a number exactly. Why? It's because they put, when they're doing the census thing, they put the Haitian as the black inside the African-American. They put them together, they're there. So it's very hard to get. But I'm going to give you a number, but it's not very, 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 you know. But um, for me, uh, regarding the people when I'm doing outreach, because I have a uh, connection with all the pastors, all the Haitian community, right now, I think it's very reasonable if I said, in the eastern shore, they have about more than three, three, three thousand Haitian, mm -hmm. right now. How, how many? Uh, three thousand. Three thousand. Yeah, three thousand. I don't have a number, but I know yeah, but as far I'm... as the minorities, after Hispanics, mm -hmm. it's like a battle between the Korean and the Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're like the number two mm -hmm. minority mm -hmm. on the eastern shore, and that's something that I had help from Dr. Manny there, so they had probably mm -hmm. would have some numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I know at the time of the earthquake, people were throwing around yes. 10, yeah. 10, 10,000 when you included Seaford. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's the number I was oh. batted about. 10,000? That's the number that was floating around wow. during. Okay. Nobody had a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question in the... Sir, sure. No? Okay. Other questions or noticings, so. connections? Yeah. Um, one of the folks who was um, looking at the exhibit... <coughs> asked the question or, or pointed out that a lot of the crops that they, you see being picked here, as you, like you mentioned, the cabbage, aren't really here. Like the landscape up the shore has, has mm -hmm. changed, the crops have changed. Mm -hmm. So they were curious as to what what crops are out there now for which this community you know, migrates here, mm. the seasonal worker crops yeah. to, to, to pick. Cause then what a minute. I don't know if you all know. <laughs> yeah, right, right now, Tomatoes and watermelons. Tomatoes and watermelons, yes. Watermelons. Cucumber. Yeah. So, how do the children of Haitian immigrants view these? We should repeat the question um, for the gentleman in the back. Do you want to repeat the question so they can hear it on the microphone? Um, so can you repeat the question again? Is their home mm -hmm. is it solitary, or is it, uh, how do they see Haiti? Is it, uh, oh, 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 okay. A friendly place, a good place? No, um, I think for most of the Haitian, Eastern Shore, in their heart, is a second place for them. Haiti is still the first place. Correct. Their children, their children, the ones that are that your children. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the big issue, issue right now. Um, during the lunch I have um, with Mr. Decker, we spent about uh, half hour to talk about that. That's the main problem we have right now with the Haitian, with the children of those uh, people. Because it's like they're more connected to the American culture. They're more connected. Because um, there is a problem of the communication, because most of those people, even though they can say I, they can say some word in English, but they are not fluent in English. In uh, African sociology, they said the language is the first 
is the first step to communicate. So if we have some problem to communicate, we can go nowhere. And inside the family, if inside the family you already have the problem to communicate, the kid, even though when the, when the parents speak, speak English with the kids, speak queer, they answer in English, that's a huge problem. They understand queer, like I have my son, he's five years. We speak queer with her friend, but every single thing we say, he answer you in English, he's five years. That's, I think that's very tough. It's very tough. You have to give him stickers. <laughs> That's what give him when I was when, <laughs> Stickers what and Dollar Tree. Stickers and Dollar Tree. Tree. Here we go. Here we go. That's some tips. How do children of immigrants view Haiti? I mean, have, do they go back to Haiti? No. I've traveled to Haiti quite a few times, and it's, it's an extremely different environment than Salisbury. Okay. So how do children see Haiti and understand Haiti? What, how do they see the, the Haiti, their parents land. Yeah, that was my, I'm going to give it to you, um, Salama. That was my, um, that was um, another side of my, of, of the, of, of my answer. The problem is there is a problem, the miscommunication inside. To be able, I am the one to sell my country to my kid, to my five years kid. If I can't talk to my kids to sell my country, how come my kids will be interested to go back? So that's my point. So that's why I'm trying to explain you the kid they saw Haiti differently than their parents. Because right now we have to do something. Uh, how do they see Haiti? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, um, I wasn't born here. Yes. I came yeah, he's born here. Yeah. Right, right. So I think a lot of your young Haitian kids, they see Haiti. Okay, so it's like whatever view that they have is what they see. Although the, if their parents travel back and forth, they can see the picture. If they don't go back there themselves, but they see what the media shows. Media, okay. So that's their main connect to Haiti. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other, if they had like personal mm -hmm. experiences of going to Haiti themselves. So unfortunately, that's the, the only reality. That the media is. has a portrait of Haiti as a very violent place. Mm -hmm. As a very dangerous place. It's a very corrupt and dysfunctional place. And it, and it is that, yeah, but it's a lot of behind other that, things behind that. that are fascinating and interesting yeah, and, and, and neat. Well, <coughs> but on the other hand, also behind, on the other hand, also behind the, behind this answer, I think also if I raise, if I try to raise my kid in the way to sell the story of my country, even though the media is going to hurt the type of view my kid will have. But I think I have, as, as a parent, I have my part of the job too. I don't know if you point. It's, a, it's, a, it's why the media is dependent on us, it's say the, the, the country is bad. But as a parent, if I do my job to sell my country to my kids, I think my kids, my, my kids will, will have another view. We had a hand up in the back. Did you want to share about this? No? Yes, she want. Yes, she will. Um, kid, I also have a teenage daughter, and one of the issues that I have with her is because if again the view, what the media presents, what she sees. But as a mother, what I do is I teach her about the history of our culture, mm -hmm. and I point out the good things, the accomplishment that we've um, accomplished as a country. So when she hear the negativity, and she can say, "Oh no, this is this." You know, I am part, um, um, I am from Haiti, while well, my parents is from Haiti as well. This is what we represent. And, and kind of, I kind of want to give her a different view versus what society yes. is showing to her. And again, with what Fritz says and what Salama say, it starts from home. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, because of the lack of knowledge with a lot of the, um, with the um, Haitian people, um, they don't know how to get that information to the to the children, so they can have a different set of mind. Yeah. So um, I believe that with our generation versus um, you know with my parents, it's totally different, and we <coughs> raise our kids and we try to give them a different image than what society is um, giving to them. You are a good mom. <laughs> Unless we have a 
different than the other two years when mm -hmm. I've been here. Yeah. Because the hate, the, the, the president people were so upset with the way they were being portrayed mm. in the media mm. yeah. that it was giving negative mm. feedback to everyone. Mm. And so any picture we took, we asked permission. If the person said no, we didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And we understood why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two of our young translators that were with us shared that many of the young people in Haiti hoped to get out, mm -hmm. which was a real issue for their mm -hmm. parents, for the parents and the people of Haiti mm -hmm. because they were, they just wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that part was sad to me. It hurt my heart that, you know, that. Yeah. Well, would you like to introduce yourself and, and why you're in, in <laughs> oh. so people can understand your connection? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Benita Harrison. I'm a pastor at Asbury United Methodist Church, okay. and I do mission work, and Haiti is one of the places I do it, and Peru is another place that mm -hmm. I do it. Thank you. So that's why I was there. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, I'm curious about that title, Hebrew... <laughs> here we go. Here we go again. Here we, here we go again. <laughs> when I was coming down to town here, I saw a whole bunch. I go, yeah. here we go again. Reality, you know. Um, but uh, but no, take it away, Fritz. It's not a Jewish Haitian necessarily. No. <laughs> it's his first name. Just the first name. Hebrew. Just just the first Hebrew. name. Yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, great, great. he's a really neat guy. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband and I were struggling in the Lowe's parking lot to get mm -hmm. something in our car, and he came and helped us yeah. and shared with us that he had come from Haiti a number of years ago and that he was here to be a part of the community and help. Yeah. And we were recipients of that. Yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. I just, I, you know, I, learned, I didn't realize I've seen Hebrew quality in the way of Hebrew. no idea. Thank you. Karen, yeah. One of the things I think that demonstrates um, how much the Haitian community wanted to succeed was the first clients that we had that settled out and we found jobs for it, they needed a car mm -hmm. to get to work. But most of them couldn't read English. They were just learning it. And so what they would do is, and they didn't know how to drive, but what they would do is to send a friend to the uh, motor vehicle yeah. and uh, with their stuff. And that friend would go get the driver's license. Of course, it had the friend's picture on it, but it had their name, right? <laughs> then you remember there used to be on the end of the driver's license a little card that if you lost your license, you could take the card in and get a new license. So they'd wait a couple of months, take the card, go back, and take their picture. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that was really ingenious because uh, they so wanted to get good jobs. Find a way. And, you know, they had to have a car, and, mm -hmm. and they were learning to drive. It's just that they couldn't read the uh, the test uh, in English. So I thought that was really yeah, very clever. Very clever. <laughs> now, they wouldn't have learned that from you at all, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> you have intimate knowledge of how to, um, how to pull that off. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to point out that Salisbury University and their nurse nursing faculty, even on the website, there's a very good document on Haitian culture for anybody who wants <laughs> to know more about <laughs> Haitian. I've, I've, I'm married to a Haitian. I live with Haitians all the time. And I, I could, like, I don't know what I would say that is not true in that mm -hmm. document. That might very, good. very good. Uh -huh. Very good. <laughs> Well, have we run out of question or we're still on a roll? We're still on a roll, good. Now, how does the uh, Haitian culture succeed in Haiti if everyone wants to uh, come here and settle out? Mm -hmm. How does that develop their culture in Haiti? Um, the good thing in Haiti is like um, there is a huge difference between the suburban people and the people who is living in the huge city. The, the, the city. Um, there is a different mentality in Haiti. If you go like, let's say, when you go to Haiti last, last week, you go, you stay, you say, I'm going to Port-au-Prince, port, the capital, 
the mentality is different. People is more willing to, to go to France, to go to move, to leave the, the, to leave the country, you know? But if you take your car, your drive, and you go further, you go like about um, junk mail, you go, you go like about car, car passion. Those people, they are so proud about their culture, most of them, they don't want to live. They don't want to live. Most of, 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 most of, the, of them, they don't, don't want to live. When, that's why when people came and people invite them, because right now I think they go, the American government, they have like um, um, a visa, a visa, a garden visa for, for Mamok. They went over there, there's a couple of cool leaders, they went over there, that's because I got the story from my friend. They went over, they went over there. Most of the people they got is there from Paul Topence. But when they try to go, to go over there, nobody want to leave those places. And that's why I always send for all the presentation that I made in Canada and everywhere, everywhere, I said, the spirit of Haiti is not on the capital. The spirit in Haiti is on those people, is on the end of those people. That's why I'm still thinking Haiti will survive a day, because those people, because the kid, those people still kept the culture from our ancestors. Guys working with a patient student, one on one with like extra tutoring for English fluency. One of the things I Excuse me. Used to be my, used to be my, my, my teacher in Warwick. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead. That's great. I'll talk afterwards. I just don't remember. But it's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him recently. He transferred to Sudbury University, and I was talking with him, and he was also much older than I thought. Yeah, as a man, the fact we have an example right now in the in the in the room, he want to go back. <laughs> He's waiting to uh, to go back. He studied the English now, but he want to go back. He think about that day and night to go back to his country. Like I want to go back. Sorry, boss. I want to go back to my country. <laughs> I want to I want to go back one day. Cause I think like if you. If you follow all the story for all the great uh, people in the world, all the revolution made by the, uh, the, the world is too, it seems too strong, not, not a revolution, all the change. <laughs> all the change was, was, was made by most of the people from the diaspora in the country. All the story. The, the people like China where they right now. China is huge right now. But most of the China, of the Chinese and people, they send those kids to study in Canada in the United States. Mm -hmm. And guess, uh, guess what? They come back to the country. Mm -hmm. And they, they just put together what they learn from this country, what their country, they put them together and you got China. And I think there's the same thing have to happen for Haiti one, 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 one day. Any other comments? Immigration work in um, recently with the TPS after the earthquake in Haiti, a lot of people came to me for their documentation. TPS temporary protection Society. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I found quite a few females that are studying nursing aid and going to, mm -hmm. and that's what their dream is to mm -hmm. go back mm -hmm. and Help. work in mm -hmm. hospitals or put their own businesses there in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them, mm -hmm. especially the females, they have, you know, mm -hmm. touched me with that mm -hmm. conversation. Um, hopefully, you know, we saw that with the Hispanic. A lot of them mm -hmm. wanted to they go want back. To work. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. A lot of them, yeah. their mission or, you know, their mm -hmm. idea was to stay here enough to make money and go back. Mm -hmm. But they got trapped here. Mm -hmm. with, yes. wage, mm -hmm. with sending money back and forth and all the issues mm -hmm. in their country. Mm -hmm. But hopefully some of them or stay with a welfare, uh, with a reform. reform. Mm -hmm. And some of them, immigration reform, or some of them will go back with a legal status a citizen mm -hmm. and have the freedom to come back mm -hmm. yeah. and with the children well, yeah. because i've seen a lot of children born here taken back mm -hmm. and they have no other ways to return mm -hmm. to their country mm -hmm. and i saw a, a documentary many years ago about haitians going to dominican republic mm -hmm. and they have no legal status in dominican republic and their children were born in the Dominican Republic, Without. but they don't have no, no status in Haiti either. Mm -hmm. So they are children without a country. Without a country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, um, my, my wife and I, we have a project right now we're working on that for a long Jack. The project, my wife, if we think we have a given back against our country. To, uh, uh, um, toward our country. Right now, the project we're working and we hope at the summer moment time we'll be able to be able to accomplish that project. We want to go like a um, medical hub to find some doctors, some equipment, some things, and go with some doctor available, some nursing available, some nurses available to go back to Haiti in the summer moment time, spend a week. There's a lot of uh, people in the sub in this community. They don't never see a doctor. They don't have any doctor. They don't have any physician. They don't know our thing. We want to spend a week or two weeks over there and bring all the things we, we would be able to, to check their blood pressure, to check everything for all of them. And it's going to be huge. This simple, this simple job is going to be a huge thing for all of them. So there is only a way to help your country. And I remember that, I think it's Kennedy said, don't never expect what your country will do for your you. You have to do something for your country. Well, thank you, uh, Fritz. And thank you, Mr. Tank. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Um, just want to say thanks to, once again, to Dr. Ray Thompson for making this forum possible and helping me to bring these, this document here. Um, so, big round of applause for Dr. Thompson and the NAB. Keeping the dialogue going.